Okay, Megan. All right. Hello. Good morning. All right. All right. Now I turn on my lab that's on. Let's try this again. Welcome to worship. Read your emails, people. Right, is this connected now? Seems to be going. Let's see what happens. All right. Let's just worship. Re Wear your mask. Wash. It starts and then it stops again. I just put new batteries in today. How about all right? How's this? Is this coming through? All right. We'll uh, hear later today uh, an invitation from our. Please join me. If it had not the troubles of our world. who made heaven and earth.
Join me for the prayer of confession. Patient Lord, forgive Lord, our lack of faith in your loving power. power. We look around us, us, and all that we see is what we don't have. We fail to notice the daily blessings you lavish upon us, clear our blindness to the needs of others, strengthen us and move us from lame excuses for not serving you. Help us to truly listen to one another, not with our pat answers ready, but with loving and generous hearts. Heal us and make us ready to truly be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The assurance of pardon. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. No hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts. God forgives and God sets free. Receive the forgiving love of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, friends. I hope that you're able to hear me. I'll put this microphone very close. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see you who are in the room with me today. It is a good day for us to be together. As we come together, I do want to say two things. First of all, if you left last week feeling like you got cheated out of your green beans, I have more green beans from my garden today. So if you'd like some green beans, there's some green beans in the back there. I'm thinking about something today that I don't usually think about in September. I'm thinking about ice skating. Have you ever gone ice skating? You guys, you guys have gone ice skating? When you have gone ice skating, have you been in a situation where you just jump out, you put on your skates, you get out there, and you just zip around and you jump in the air and you do figure eights on your first time? 
That's not how it was for me. My first time ice skating, boy, I held somebody's hand, and then as soon as I could, I got to that wall. And then I just stayed on the wall as long as I could going around the rink. The wall helped me stay up. We don't, we're not born learning how to ice skate. We don't know how to ice skate when we're born. We have to learn. And one of the best things about learning how to ice skate is having people who are with us. And when Danielle read for us that Bible verse that said, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees, that made me think about the fact that part of what we do together is we help each other. Just like if we're ice skating, my granddaughter was learning how to ice skate the first time this year, and I took her, and I pretty much just dragged her around by the hand because her knees weren't strong enough to do it. She didn't know how to do things. She'll get better. I bet you have gotten better, haven't you? Yeah. And so one day, my granddaughter will be the one who's holding someone else's hand and helping that person along. What we want to do is we want to be people who are encouraging folks who need some help and who are receiving help when we need it ourselves. That's the goal that we have. And I'm glad that we can be a church together to work on that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the ability to be together. We are grateful for your love and for your care and the way that we can share that care with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, a number of friends and I were invited to a party. Do you remember those things? We would receive invitations from somebody. We would gather in each other's homes and share food, laugh, conversation. We touch each other. Those were good times. This particular set.
celebration was an all-day drop-in affair. It was a, an open house of sorts. And because it was some distance away, a group of about eight of us agreed that we would carpool together. And as we drove to the home, we discussed the fact that each of us wanted to be there, but none of us really wanted to be there all day. So I said to Sharon and I, having been married for a couple of years, a couple of decades, have devised this little code, we know how to signal each other when it's time to go. And so I suggested that we as a group figure out a code so that we could communicate within the group when it was time to exit in a way that didn't uh, embarrass our hosts or frustrate ourselves. And after a few minutes, Carly said, Dave, when one of us is ready to go, we'll ask if you visited your grandchildren lately. If anybody comes up to you and says, so Dave, have you been to Ohio lately? That's the clue, it's time to go. And it worked like a charm. You have codes like that with the people who are in your life. You know when a friend is getting ready to end the conversation, when your spouse is getting on your last nerve. Sometimes you know when the preacher is coming to the end of the sermon. We work on these things. And so you might not be surprised when I tell you that in the first century, when people like Paul and John and James were writing the letters that formed half of the New Testament, there were some common indicators that the author was moving to wrap things up. Paul often shifts from matters in the community that he's addressing and mentions his plans for the upcoming season. Sometimes the author will call out certain individuals by name or add a stylized farewell. And yet the letter of James doesn't have any of these indicators. There are no signs of familiarity, no personal PSs. And if you stop and think about it, that makes sense with what we know about this letter, what we said at the beginning. You remember back at the beginning of this, we said that James is what we call a Catholic epistle. Doesn't mean it's written only to Roman Catholics, but it's addressed to everyone. James didn't know his audience personally. He just sends out this letter in the hopes that someone, somewhere, will find it to be of encouragement to growing as a follower of Jesus. So, if James doesn't use any of the normal tells, how does he wrap things up? He moves towards his conclusion by seeking to echo some of the prominent themes with which he began his message. In the last few weeks, we read some pretty stern challenges from James on some fairly hot topics. He warned the entire Christian community about dealing appropriately with conflict, seeking justice, living gracefully. And now he concludes by softening his tone and shifting to an empathetic voice. And he does so with a series of direct imperatives, saying essentially, be patient, be trustworthy, be connected. The first of these imperatives is highlighted in verses 7 to 11, where he emphasizes the importance of perseverance and endurance. And in using Job as an illustration, he's giving voice to the very profound cry of suffering people everywhere. Every single one of us has faced the temptation to ask, does God even see me? When times are difficult, it's easy to wonder if God has forgotten us. And sometimes it gets so bad that we or those we love say, what if God does see me, but just doesn't care? In his exhortation to be patient, the author James reminds his readers, whoever they are, to take the long view. And he invites them to look back hundreds of years and encourages them to trust in the same one who has guided the journey thus far, that that person has not left us. And the next section of the chapter is fairly brief. It's a single verse exhorting those who would follow Jesus to be trustworthy. 
The author of James makes the rather obvious point that if someone is in the habit of saying every now and then something like, look, I swear this is true, that would seem to indicate that there's a real possibility that some of the other things that person is saying are not true. Makes sense, right? If you have come to see me as a person of integrity, then I don't need to say. No, seriously, this, this is true. I'm not lying. You can listen to this. Instead, you'll listen to what I say, and it won't occur to you to doubt my word. Now, some folks in our world have taken this verse quite literally, and there have been those who, upon entering public office or serving on a jury, refuse to say the words, I solemnly swear. And instead, they say, I solemnly affirm. Now, I respect that, but I'm not sure that's the point of the author right in this passage. I think that James is simply saying that it's tough enough in the world without having to wonder if you can count on the integrity of the people with whom you're sharing a journey. His plea is simple. Live like someone who can be trusted. The longest exhortation in this section is a call for the Church of Jesus Christ to remain connected to one another, even during difficult times. Perhaps you remember that when we started the series of messages, I told you that the author had a nickname. James was called Old Camel Knees. This moniker came from the fact that James spent so much time in prayer that his knees developed calluses on them that reminded his friends of the way that a camel's knees look. Now, remember, we are assuming that James did not know any of the recipients of this letter, but he knows enough about the power of prayer and the nature of community to implore his readers to make sure that they were connected to each other in real and honest relationships. And note that he calls the church to be in prayer every season. And, and there are times when I ask somebody, how can I be in prayer for you this week? And my friend will look a little embarrassed and, and reply by saying, oh, you know, Dave, uh, I'm good. I can't think of anything that I need right now. As if prayer is some kind of an Amazon wish list. If I have everything I need, then I don't have anything on my list. But if I'm lacking something, then I'll throw it out there. James highlights the fact that prayer is an appropriate response to every circumstance in life. Are you having a rough day? Then pray about it. Maybe you can't imagine life being any better now. Then pray about it. Has your world been rocked by illness? Pray about it. And James spent some time talking specifically about acts of confession, a suggestion that was just as countercultural then as it is today. And the wording here suggests that while it's probably helpful to spend some time naming the specific sins that have damaged my life or my witness, it is as important or even more so to recognize the ways that we participate in sin collectively. I encountered with great admiration the practice of this discipline the first time I visited South Sudan. We were visiting refugee camps, witnessing the horrors of war and slavery and tribalism and genocide. And the leaders of the church there began just about every single worship service or prayer meeting with a public confession that these great evils did not exist in a vacuum. But rather, my friends insisted that they, collectively, had settled for less than God's best, and they had come to see the fruit that was killing them or those that they loved. And so every gathering was marked with the beginning of a call to confession and a laying bare of themselves. I see that same understanding in a recent book by Jim Wallace, in which he calls racism America's original sin. And yet so often, when any of us is confronted by a structural evil, we flee to the land of individualism, and we declare our own personal virtue 
in a place where other people are staying. When I was a kid, I went to a camp where there was a game that we would play after every meal where each table would challenge the next table with a rhyme or a chant of some sort. And one that sticks in my memory and maybe in yours as well, there ain't no flies on us. There ain't no flies on us. There might be flies on some of you guys, but there ain't no flies on us. Now that made for fun at camp dinner time, but it's lousy theology. There's not a person hearing my voice, or perhaps watching my lips move, who is unstained by the sin of racism, or sexism, or greed, or, well, you get the idea. James says that growing in the practice of confession is one way to liberate us all from the effects of these evils. James goes on to expand the thought to make sure that the readers know that he's talking about praying together. Again, he's not mocking the people who have a nightly ritual that includes how I lay me down to sleep. But he is affirming the fact that praying with other people is a way of empowering and encouraging each other in difficult times. In a few moments, I'm going to ask for prayer concerns, and some of you in the room may offer a name. Some of you online may post a comment about a particular situation. And when we do this, as simple as it is, we are taking some steps to break the silence and isolation of those who may feel as though they are alone or unseen. When your community takes the initiative to reach out to you with prayerful concern, it is a way of noticing your pain and saying that you matter. It helps each of us develop the empathy of Christ. And if we can remember that we can all, we are all in this together. And as he does this, James refers to one of the most highly respected voices in his own tradition, Elijah, a prophet who's mentioned nearly three dozen times in the New Testament. He refers to Elijah by reminding his readers that this great prophet of God was a human being just like us. James seeks to make Elijah's story more accessible to the normal people who are reading the letter by saying that the prophet was not some kind of spiritual rock star, but rather an ordinary person who grew in his ability to be present to God and to neighbor. And I love the fact that the author of James says Elijah was a human being just like us. Right there, the author of the letter is himself identifying with the reader of the letter, using the first person plural. In simple and open humility, this is a way of saying, look, never forget, don't allow each other to forget, that we are all in this together. And then we get to the closing. In the final sentences of this letter, James takes the reader all the way back to the first sentence. In James 1.1, we understand that James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, is writing to the twelve tribes in dispersion. The letter begins by acknowledging that the world is a fragmented, and lonely and sometimes dangerous place. And we are often torn from each other and tempted to isolation. The Christian community then, as it is now, was scattered, often uncomfortable sometimes maybe even unseen. In his last breath to the churches of the first century, the brother of Jesus implores the followers of Christ to be on the lookout for one another. We have to find ways to stay connected, even when it's difficult. We must not give up on each other. And it's so easy. It's too easy to think, you know what? That guy has been on my last nerve one too many times. I'm done with him. He's dead to me. I'm sick and tired. And so we delete, we unfriend, we block, we forget, we leave. And in so doing, in some cases, we leave that person or ourselves hanging out to dry. James calls us to remember that that's not how life in the kingdom is supposed to be. The church is not our idea. We didn't wake up this morning and decide to get together with a bunch of people that we really like and with whom we agree on everything in order to form a club so 
so that we can pursue the things that interest us. No, we heard a call. We received an invitation. And we showed up. And when we did, we found the rest of this crew. And in some ways, we're stuck with each other. We don't get to choose who's in the church. But yet each of us every day has to choose how we're going to treat each other. Beloved, take it from old camel knees. Look for ways to engage with each other patiently and honestly and prayerfully. These days are long days. And the developing awareness of systemic racism, the implacable advance of the coronavirus, the vitriol surrounding the upcoming election, the uncertainty of our economy, they all make every day seem even longer. And I guarantee you that right now someone is asking, does God even see me? Maybe even, does God see me and maybe not even give up that one? Remember that you are not alone. Remember that you will not always get it right. Remember that me or the other folks in the room, that we won't always get it right. And then remind the people around you of these truths again and again and again and again. In fact, I might even suggest that the one thing that the church is called to do is to become that signal or cue that lets the people around you know that you know where they are. That God knows who they are. And that nobody is in any place by themselves. Thanks be to God who calls us together and who sends us out to each other, with each other, into the world. Amen. Amen.
that you'll be able to pick up on this. This is a very important series that we are inviting our entire congregation to participate in regarding race and God's mission. It's a four-week study in October, and I'd like to introduce you virtually to Brenda Salter McNeil, who will be one of the facilitators for that. I just say keep praying for those who are learning in all different ways and teaching in all different ways, and especially that we would be protected from the virus. And I bet that everybody at home heard you better than they will hear me because you're only eight <laughs> inches from the microphone. We uh, join in celebration with our friend Joanne Holt. Joanne became a grandmother earlier this week, and we welcome her grandson Nico into this world. I will share with you prayer of joys. I've had several conversations this week with those who are experiencing pregnancy and for whom that is a great gift. I've also had a conversation with those who have experienced pregnancy loss this week, and that is a great suffering. And you know, they say you don't know what people are fighting when they're walking around the world, and that's really true right now. I invite you to be in prayer and rejoin our nation in prayer uh, as we consider the death of uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the effect that that will have on the increasingly divisive political climate in our world and in our country. We pray that the church might be a place of reason and peace. We lift up those of our friends and brothers and sisters who are battling with wildfires in the west, hurricanes and tropical 
the storms in the south, famine overseas. Let's continue and give thanks to God and worship and prayer. Lord, we ask that you would, in your holy power, that you would grant first and foremost to the folks about whom we've spoken, those whose names we know and those whose names are not yet known to us, that you would grant to them an awareness of their having been seen and heard and loved. That you would use us to do that if it's possible. That you would use other folks. We pray for your church to be a strong agent of your love and hope and reconciliation in this world. We ask, Lord, that you would make a way where it seems as though all has been lost. We pray for those who put their lives on the line in order to seek to serve their neighbor. We lift up to you those who are struggling in the midst of the storm and pray that your comfort and your solace might dwell with them. We ask, Lord, that you would equip us to be your church at this time and this place and that you would strengthen us in our resolve to carry the message of hope in Jesus Christ to the world. We are grateful for the invitation that we have received. We ask that we might become faithful in our living into that. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and for his name's sake. Let's pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, the opportunity is ours to proclaim the goodness of God through offering ourselves and the first fruits of our labors. May all that we give be a testimony to God's purposes among us. Let us give with generosity and joy. For those in the room this morning, please know that there are plates in the rear of the sanctuary in which to place your gifts. Those of you online, you see instructions on your screen.
นั่นเอเมน